I drew a diagram up on the board last time that, that sort of, in my mind, sort of gives you a good overview of how things work together and focuses on what's important and the role between content design and goals. The goals, by definition, are why you're making a site. You're not making a website to show off your pretty web design skills. You're making it to serve some purpose, some goal. So that's boom at the top. All right. Now, we understand that in this sort of communication, it's a two-way street. You know, It's not just your goals as an organization that's important. It's the goals of your users as well. All right. For a website to be successful, it needs to do a little bit of both. It needs to serve the needs of the users. It needs to serve the needs of the organization. All right, uh, giving away free music um, on a band's website would serve the needs of the users. They'd love that, right? But that wouldn't really serve the needs of the organization. All right. On the other hand, the users have to get something out of the deal too, whether it be entertainment or information or the ability to purchase something or whatever. The users need to have their goals satisfied, at least in part. So that's at the top. I mean, that almost, how do I want to say this? It, it almost goes without saying, as, as is often said. But I found out a lot of things that go without saying are often important to say <laughs> because it's easy to forget them. All right? And it's easy to put other things on top of those. Especially, again, when you look at books about web design. A lot of times, they, you know, they'll start right off the bat talking about fonts and this and that. Not to say those aren't important, but they're not the first thing that you consider. Content and design, then, are the two pillars on which these goals rest. And as you might imagine, you know, you remove one of those pillars and the whole thing comes tumbling down. All right. Content is king is, is a saying that's been around as long as web pages have been around. And the idea there is that the content that you create supports those goals. So you put stuff on the page not because, yeah, well, we'll end up with this on there. Well, you put that on there because that serves one of the goals, either the goals of the organization or the goals of the users. Design supports those goals as well. And when we talk about design, we're, we talk about sort of two different things. We can talk about structural things. And we can talk about surface sort of things. Structural things are things like, you know, how the navigation is set up, how you divide your pages, how you divide your content into pages. And we talked about last time with sporting goods, you could divide any topic a number of different ways. We talked about sporting goods, you could divide by season of the year, you could divide by um, sport, you could divide by brand, you could divide by type of product and all that. You figure out what makes most sense to the users and will serve the, the goals of the users. So the goals are the driving force. All right. So far we've talked about, I think, three of the five sections of your design project. We talked about the goals, where you document the goals of you and of your users. And we talked about creating user personas. Because not everyone visiting your site is going to come with the same set of goals. And while it's true that everyone's individuals, you can't create a website for 7 billion people on Earth. So instead, you, you pick a few sort of um, model people that represent, are representative of most of your users. So that's the strategy section. Define the, define the goals for you. Define the goals for... By you, I mean the organization. Define the goals for the users. And define who the personas are. Who's going to be visiting the site. You do that right up front. And you keep that in mind at every point, at every decision that you make. The 
content then supports the goals. The contents are in the scope section. And there's simply a list of requirements of the stuff that you're going to have on the page. The page is going to have my band schedule. The page is going to have video clips. The page is going to have, or, or the site's going to have. And a whole list of things that it's going to have. Keeping in mind that the content supports the goals. So therefore, anything that you put on the site should be relevant to at least one of the goals. And every goal that you have defined should have at least one, or more, more than likely more than one, piece of content related to that goal. The design we talked about existing on two levels. The structure level, and we talked about um, part of that last time when we started talking about the hierarchy chart or the structure chart of how the website's going to be organized. Where we said the sporting goods store might have a home page and then a, a section for each sport or whatever. So, strategy, scope, structure. We've covered those three things. Strategy are the goals and personas. Scope are the list of requirements. Structure is a chart like this that gives an overview of the navigation of a site. Any questions about any of that? The last two phases are deal with the structure of individual pages, and then finally, how individual pages are going to look. All right? That's the point that we start talking about colors and fonts and so on. All right? So, in the structure chart, we sort of define the different pages that we're going to have and how it's going to be organized. In the skeleton phase, we start describing what the pages are going to look like, but sort of on an overview level, on an outline level. And the output of this section are what are called wireframes. A sample wireframe might look like this. Might look like that. A wireframe, you simply define the sections of the site and how they're going to appear as just big building blocks, as just big blocks. No detail, nothing like that, but you simply define how they're going to look. Now for a simple site, this is one of the common ones. All right? You will notice that the labels that I gave them very closely correspond to the HTML5 structural tags, right? You have your header, you have a nav, you have content, which could be articles or sections or whatever, and then finally you have a footer. So that's an example of a wireframe. It's just a sketch out, like if you're going to pull out a napkin and you're going to tell someone this is how your site's going to be organized. Not detailed, doesn't show exactly what's going to be in those, but it's a design like that. What are other common things? Other common things would be to do something like this. Have a header on the top. Have a navigation going this way. Having the content area here. And then having a footer area on the bottom. Now, Here's sort of the good news. We've learned by keeping the content separate from the presentation and the appearance that we can design our pages such that we can easily change the CSS to change from one to the other. All right? I believe I showed the CSS Zen Garden site where there's one page that looks hundreds of different ways that are way different from each other. We can easily come up by simply changing the CSS to get a different appearance. So if we go with one and we decide that we want to change, it's not so bad, not so hard to change. Will every page on the site have, a same, have the same wireframe? Yeah. 
They don't have to. All right? Depending on the, on the page, and that's a good answer, they don't have to. They could, right? Especially when you're dealing with smaller sites, like, like what you're doing for, for uh, your project. Every page could have one of the, you know, could have that layout or that layout. That's fine. Sometimes, though, you might have a set of pages that, for whatever reason, you want to treat differently. Can you think of an example of a page on the site that might have a different layout than the rest of the pages? Yes? The home page is like probably one of the most obvious ones. You might want a slightly different layout on the home page than you have on the rest of them. Can anyone think of another example? Contact us, maybe. How so? Okay, maybe. A couple examples I might think of. You might have photo gallery pages that look a little different because you want to put a lot of photos and thumbnails on it, so those might be set up a little bit different. So that's one example. Anything that you might want the user to print out might be organized differently, right? Um, I, like, you know, like if you go... Um, Many websites have where you uh, you can you know you can view their article or you can print it out or like you can print out um, Google Maps and all that. You might not want you know there's no need to print out the navigation, all right, because you can't click on the sheet of paper and go to that page, right? So the the print the printed the printed version of the page um, has a different layout than the, than the actual um, page that you view on the screen. So yeah, for whatever special reason you might have, the home page is a classic example, and then other pages as you see fit. The bottom line is that you'll have at least one, right? You ought to have at least one, and you probably will not have one per page, all right? There's probably no need for every one of your pages to have a different layout. In fact, that's probably a very bad idea, all right? One or two wireframes is probably all you will have for your entire site, given the, the kinds of sites that you're developing for your project. All right? So don't think you need to draw a sketch for every single page. Draw a wireframe for the main page, and then if you think the home page should look different or another specialized page should look different, then do a wireframe for that. But that's all a wireframe is, is it's showing sort of the blocks of how it is. All right? Questions? When we get into larger sites, the wireframe could be more complicated. So, for example... we look at LC's website. <coughs> Excuse me. First of all, we'll notice that there a different wire there's there is a different wireframe for their home page than there is for the rest of the pages. Let's go to one of their regular content pages. Notice, for, notice another thing, for example. What word did we describe these things up here as? Those are personas, right? Current students. Now, they don't, they don't give a fake name like we suggested to do. We didn't say, Mary, you click here, all right? But current students click here. Future students click here. Now, because this is a site with a lot of pages on it, the wireframe is going to be a little more complex than what I had. There is, first of all, the home page has a different layout. Each of these sort of sections have, a, have the same layout, though, right? Current students, there's a navigation here. There's another navigation there. Future students has the same sort of thing. Maybe. There we go. And if we pick one of these, these sort of main content pages, 
all have the same layout. There's a banner on the top which is consistent on every single page. There is a, what are called breadcrumbs up here. Breadcrumbs sort of show you the path of how you've gotten there. There is a sub-navigation here, right? This navigation relates to what section you're in. It's different than this navigation, which is the same on every single page. There's a set of announcements over here on the side. Students ask me, uh, so one of the students in this class, I forget which one, asked me like what an aside would be used for as opposed to a section. This is a classic example of an aside, right? The main stuff is over here, and this is like here's some other stuff that you might be interested in. Finally, there is a footer somewhere at the bottom that is common on every page. So if we're going to sketch this wireframe out, I hope I can do it from memory. I believe we saw three wireframes there. We saw a wireframe for the home page, which was like this. Banner, announcements, footer, um, slideshow, and then stuff. Alright? If I was going to sketch out a wireframe for the home page, that's what I would draw. That level of detail. For each section page, like for example, when, when we click student, uh, current student, the wireframe looked like this. There's the navigation, or the header rather. Oh, I forgot the nav here. There's a header. There's a nav. There was an image, I believe. There was the announcements. Footer. Nav. And sub nav. Finally, there was the detail or content page that has a header, nav, announcements, footer, sub nav, and then content. So, a big site like this, even though there's, you know, I don't know how many pages on LC's website, hundreds easily, even that it only has three wireframes, all right? Because each of these pages sort of serve a different role, all right? The home page is obviously the home page. The section page is there's a section for new students, there's a section for current students. This is kind of a grouping of a whole bunch of pages relevant to one of the personas, one of the typical types of users. And finally, the detail page where most of the actual content lives. And so we have those three different wireframes for that. So for your site, which is, I think I define six to eight pages, it's entirely possible you'll have a single wireframe. You can, however, have more than one wireframe if you wanted the home page to look a little different. Questions on this? This is part of design as well. Again, structuring and laying out your page in an obvious way so that things are done consistently and all that are an important part of design. In a way, you sort of teach the user through your design how to use your site. The navigation appears consistently in a certain part. People are going to understand that. All right? If they see every page when they, on LC's site, there's that navigation on the top, they'll come to expect it there. And if it's not there, it's going to be confusing. Consistency is very important in design. It's a very important design principle. But consistency doesn't mean that every page needs to have 
an identical structure, but sort of a, a consistent look and feel is something that is, is generally speaking, um, an important design principle. So this is one aspect of design, structuring. First of all, structuring the pages into how, or I'm sorry, structuring the content into which pages you're going to have, and then sort of structuring each page on how that in general terms is going to be laid out. The last part is called the surface part, and here's where we actually start making web pages. All right? First four steps you could do without a computer, believe it or not. You could write out the goals by hand. You could write, uh, describe the personas by hand. You could write a list of requirements by hand. You could uh, um, sketch out a structure chart by hand, and so on. The design takes place up here. All right? You put it on paper to document it so you can share it. But you're not actually making web pages until this last page, last phase, which is the surface phase. And with the surface phase, you're going to construct a prototype. All right. How uh, how would how would uh, any of you define what what it, what a prototype is? What does it mean when I say I have a prototype for something? Testing. Testing. All right. Yes. First, First attempt. All right, first attempt at something, testing. Anyone else? Right, right. First, first serious attempt, or first attempt of moving in the direction of being the final version. All right. A prototype. A prototype mean different things depending on what you're talking about, right? If you're talking about a prototype for an iPhone, for example, all right, what do you suppose would be in a prototype for an iPhone? Let's say I'm going to develop the iPhone, what are they up to, 8, 9, whatever. All right, let's say I'm going to do the next one. What do you think a prototype for that would, would contain? Maybe a new operating system? On any level. Okay, it would have the hardware in there. The new hardware that I planned on using. Yeah, a demo. All right. Um, a de and in fact, a demo is a good way to put it. Would every application that exists be installed on that iPhone? Probably not. But enough application so that you could give it to someone and they could play with it and see, hey, you know, what does, a, you know, does this work right? You know, does this look like it's going to be good to use? So, a prototype for an iPhone would probably be the size, right? It'd probably be the proper size. I'm not going to come and hand you this and say, here's a prototype I built for an iPhone, right? Because that would be like, Misleading. That would be, how do I want to say it? That, that, would be, that would not give an accurate picture of what the final product is going to be. So the intent of a prototype is to give an accurate picture of what the final product is going to be without necessarily doing everything that the final product is going to do. All right? So in the case of a website, what would a good prototype contain? Well, okay, that might be an example of what it wouldn't contain. It wouldn't contain, perhaps, perhaps a prototype for a website would not contain the final verbiage for everything, and it might just have placeholder text. All right. What do you think would be important to capture in the prototype? Yes. Yeah, the wireframe, exactly. So you'd want to implement the wireframe. So you'd want to have something there for each section, even if it wasn't finished. All right. So you'd want to have, in the case of this, you'd want to have a banner, navigation, announcements. Um, in some cases, you won't have the final text. I will say some people freak out when they see Greek text. Some people freak out when they see 
test data from an application. I remember I worked years ago, this was before web pages were even dreamed up, all right? And I worked for a car rental company, and I just, I was, I was testing out some report, so I was showing it to the manager of the one department, uh, and I had something goofy, like I had a car, and the cost of it was $12,000, or something like that, something dumb. I just put a number, you know, probably the first six keys I typed was the price of the car. And I'm like trying to show them to try to get the idea, like, is this the right format of the report? And the person just got so hung up on that, like, you wouldn't pay $12,000 for that car. Yeah, I know. I made that up. It's pretending, well, well how, how does it say that, you know? How are we going to make sure our system, do, you know? It's like they got so hung up on that detail that they couldn't see past it and say, hey, look, this is just a prototype. This is just meant for you to look and examine. And that's why sometimes it does pay to take a little bit of time to make, uh, to, to put actual content in a page, even if it's not complete, all right? I guess if you're confident in your skills to explain to someone the purpose of Greek text, then, you, you know, you're welcome to use it. But again, sometimes people, people can sort of be confused. In addition, sometimes people want an idea of what sort of things are going to be there, and Greek text doesn't really give that. So, for example, on the home page of a college, if I put Greek text, they wouldn't know that maybe what I plan on doing is explaining that Lorain County Community College is located in Elyria, Ohio, in Lorain County. It has 15,000 students and 200 faculty, whatever, all right? So it might be good to take a stab at the real content, even though you know it's not going to be complete. Again. A prototype for a website ought to contain enough to give an accurate picture on how the website is going to look and act, but not so much as it's a finished product. So, for example, if I just came up with a page that said, well, link, 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 picture, whatever, people are going to say, well, that doesn't really tell me anything. I can't imagine what that's going to look like in its final form. Yet, if you spend too much time on it and you perfect the prototype, what's the danger of that? If I make a prototype and it's perfect, what's the danger of making a perfect prototype? Like what if they don't like it? They say, oh, that's horrible. Then you spend more time than you need to on the prototype. In a way, the prototype you build, um, because regardless of what we do in all the previous steps of the design process, they're important. A lot of times people can only really grasp what a website's going to look like and, and behave like when they actually see a finished or semi-finished version of it. So you create a prototype so someone can sit at it, play with it, click on some links, see what it's going to do, and so on. So, what might not be in a prototype? We already mentioned you might not have the final version of the text. What are other things that you might not have in a prototype? Yeah, maybe your images, maybe you don't have the actual images that you're going to have. Maybe you just have a placeholder image. Yes. Oh, I, I, thought, you were, I thought you were saying something. Anything else? Do you need to have all the pages of the site? Probably not. All right. In other words, um, if I was doing a prototype for Lane County Community College, I might pick one academic division and do that. With the thought that if I do engineering, business, and IT, that health sciences is going to look about the same, just with their information in there. And arts and humanities is going to look about the same, and, and so on down the line. So I might not need to do every single page. I just will pick some of the pages. All right? It's an art to create a prototype. I mean, you really have to use some judgment because you don't want to do too much or you don't want to do too little. You don't want to do too little because if you do too little, you're not really giving the person an accurate picture of what your page or what your site is going to look like. If you do too much, you run the risk of wasting time. And if what you've done is horrible, then 
it might take a lot of work to correct that and you're going to have to undo stuff. Now the good news is, especially with what we're doing with CSS, that if it's simply a matter of rearranging stuff on the, on the, on the page, we can do that with CSS pretty easily. So that's the good news. Um, all right, any questions about this? So for your assignment, for your project, your prototype should consist of at least three of your pages. So that's a half to a third, depending on how many pages you do. I would think the home page would be one page that you'd want to include in your prototype. The home page is sort of the site's appearance to the outside world. All right. It's what most people are going to see first. So it would make sense to get that done right. And then pick two other pages. So that's what you will turn in whatever day that is due. All right. I, I don't recall. But you'll turn in a prototype that, or you'll turn in a design document that consists of goals, requirements, the structure of the site, wireframes for the pages, and then a prototype. Why do we do this? Again, we do this for two reasons. Reason number one is to capture your thoughts on paper. A lot of people said, a lot of people say, my design is up here. I know exactly what I'm going to do. Well, that's all well and good, except that if it's up there, you're liable to sort of remember what you planned on doing and sort of not remember what you plan on doing. In addition, the second reason is you need to be able to communicate it to other people. You need to be able to communicate it to the people that you're developing the site for. And finally, you need to communicate it to people that may be working with you on the site. You know, you, if it's a larger site, you may have several developers working on that. You need to, need to be able to communicate this information to them. Questions about this? All right. So here is our next goal in this class. And this is, a, uh, this is probably the most um, involved CSS stuff that we're going to get into. And that is how to turn our wireframe into a web page. All right. In other words, how do we achieve a layout with CSS? So far in this class, most of the pages that I've seen, unless you've gone beyond what was required, your pages flow very linearly. First thing, second thing, third thing, fourth thing, fifth thing. All right. And you could make it colorful if you wanted. You could use different fonts. You could do all different kinds of things. But until we get into CSS concerning layout, that's pretty much what you're limited to. First thing, second thing, third thing, fourth thing, fifth thing. All right. So our next step is largely about taking and giving us more control over the way your page is going to be laid out. Because that's important, all right? The layout constitutes sort of a visual language, whereas people can just glance at your page and get a sense of the content, even if they don't read the words on the page. Do a quick search here. Do any of you speak Icelandic? I pick that because the population of Iceland is approximately the same population as Loring County. 
Therefore, it's very unlikely that anyone in my class would speak Icelandic. If I, if I said French or Spanish or German or Russian, I'm liable to get someone in here. This is a demonstration just of how much information we can get just based on the way the site is laid out. Even if we don't understand a single word of it. All right. What's this? An ad. What's this? Ad. That's an ad. What is the name of the site? MBL.is. What is the most important article on this page? Probably this one here. All right. What's more important, this or this? This or this? Well, you can see that that's probably more important, and so on. And we could do that the rest of the way, you know. It would seem that any of this stuff is probably more important than any of this stuff. All right? It would seem like this is sort of of side interest. It's kind of put off to the side and so on. A lot of scrolling on this page. Not sure I like that, but hey. The point is, is that we can tell at a glance, just by looking at it, we can get some information about it. All right, and I could have pulled up the navigation and said, okay, we, it's easy to see what the navigation is on this site. In fact, let's do that. Main navigation, sub navigation. Oh, that's the ad. I'm sorry. Main navigation up here. All right. Search up there. Where do you think you would log on? I'm guessing this guy up here. All right. Again, I can't read a word of this. I've seen other sites, and that's typically where it is with the little person icon there. That does bring up another rule, the importance of conventions in web design. All right? Other way, you know, over time, certain conventions have appeared in web design. For example, search bars are typically on the top right corner of the page. Do you have to follow those conventions? Mm. No. However, there's a danger if you don't that you're going to confuse people. So unless you've got a good reason, it's probably best to follow those conventions. All right? I'm trying to think of certain things that we have conventions for, like a light switch. What? Generally, up is... Off, down is, or is that not the case? I'm trying to think. Up is usually on, and down is on. Right, right, that makes sense. Yeah, so could you install a light switch that worked the other way? Certainly. What's the risk? 
risk very confused people. Does that mean that you never do it? No. It means if you're going to buck one of these conventions, have a good reason for doing it. All right. First thing that we're going to explore is what's called the um, CSS box model. All right. The CSS box model is how block tags get treated and some of the properties associated with block tags. What is a block tag, first of all? I don't know if I explicitly mentioned this in class, but book probably talked about it. That's true. It's, it's, it's a block of content. And what's special about that block? How does, it, how does a block tag vary from an inline tag? Uh -huh. Block tags stack up on top of each other, whereas inline tags go from side to side. So what's an example of a block tag? A paragraph is an example of a block tag. So each paragraph is going to be on its own line. All right? Versus a link, an A tag, an A tag is an inline tag. In other words, if I just have two or three links, they're going to be right next to each other. So, what we're going to study here is we're going to study the block model. All right? And I'm going to go and I'm going to take a page. And I'm going to start out. I'm just going to put some blocks in here. And then we're going to play with some of the attributes. All right. So, header is a block tag. H1 is a block tag, H2 is a block tag, and so on. I'm going to put a header and a section. Both of those are block tags. Again, both of these are, uh, came in into usage in HTML5, and they're meant to represent specific sorts of sections of your page. In the old days, we used things like divs to do that. Now, I'm going to cheat because I'm allowed to, all right? And I'm going to put my CSS code right in my HTML file, all right? Why would you not do that? What is wrong with doing that? Exactly. There's really nothing wrong with it if you're just doing one page. If you're doing multiple pages, though, you're likely to want to share CSS between them, in which case it's better if the CSS is in its own file. Then I can change it in one file and it applies across the board. But since I'm just doing this one page example, um, it's acceptable for me to just put the CSS on one page. So I'm going to start out by having a, a style and And I'll put an H1 and H2. Are H1s and H2s block tags? Was that a yes or a no? Yes. Yes, they are. Because if I go and save this, H1 and H2 appear 
on their own lines. They're stacked like blocks. Okay, we've already seen a few things that we can do with this. So let's go and repeat that. Let's, let's give the H1s and H2s a, a certain background color and certain text color. So I will make the background blue, color white. So how's my page going to look? H1 is going to be a brighter blue with white font. The H2 is going to be a darker blue. Why a darker blue? Because, no, <laughs> that's green, yeah. It's going to be such a dark blue, it's going to turn green. All right, that's what I wanted to do. It's going to be a darker blue because, again, the, the two numbers for blue, 6-6, six, six, are turned down some. All the way up would be FF. All right, zero, 0 would be all the way off. So 6-6 six, six is turned a little bit on, but not much on. So it's going to be a dark blue. So let's go and look at this page in the browser. And sure enough, we can see that it might even be <coughs> tough to tell. It's even tough for me to tell on the monitor that that's not black, all right? <coughs> but, <coughs> but clearly it's a darker blue. Let's turn it up a little bit. Let's turn up the AA. Because I want, I want it to be clear that it's blue. All right. There is clear on the monitor. I'm not sure if it's clear for you or not. We'll try one more. All right. There, I think, I think we can see that that's blue, but it's darker blue than that. Now, there's so many things that because we haven't put a style on it, the browser assumes. All right? The browser, notice the browser puts space between those things. All right? We didn't specify that. The browser did it on its own. There's space between the edge of the page and the block. There's space between blocks. All right. The space between things is called the margin. All right. So even though I did not specify a margin, remember your web page looks the way it does based on a combination of the CSS that you've put in it and the defaults of the browser. So by default, there is a margin between these things. If I want to get rid of that margin, I can say margin 0px. And I'll do that both for the H1 and the H2. All right. And now notice how they're jammed up against each other. What about this little teeny space? Where does that come from? Not, not, the, not the heading, not the border. The body itself actually has a margin by default. So I could say body... One second. And there it goes from side to side. Yes? No, other than it, it, it makes sense to me. The, the, the practice would be to um, do it in a way that's, that's readable for you. 
So in other words, it may, you know, if I think about it, the way the tags are set up, the body tags on top and then the header tags are inside of those, so I, that's, that's why I did it. It would still work if you did it the other way. Now, can we get, can we get rid of these margins now that we did that? I'm thinking no. Let's see. Let's test it out. So there's no margin on the body, but there's still a margin for the H1 and H2. What if I want everything on the page to have zero margin? Well, I can do this. I can put a wild card in. Star margin 0px. That'll give everything on the page no margin. All right? Then I can go back in and add margin to the individual elements if I want to do that. All right. Keep in mind, I am just. This is just for demonstration purposes. I'm not. I'm not doing it with any sort of purpose in mind. I'm just demonstrating the capabilities. So mar. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. So margin is the space between things. I just did a star margin zero px. And that gives everything zero margin. I will often do that and then add margin to the stuff that I want. All right? Now, let's say I want... Let's do this. Remember, margin is one of those shorthand properties. Because there's actually four margins, right? There's a top margin, there's a right margin, there's a bottom margin, and there's a left margin. So I could either say margin top 0px, margin left 0px, and so on. Or if I say margin 0px, then everything gets that. Now, what if I do this? Margin dash bottom... Thirty px. Px is pixels. I'm going to save that and hit refresh. Well, there's thirty px's between these now. Why are there thirty px's? Well, because I said the margin is the space between elements. So I have h1. I said the margin on the bottom is 30px, then I have the h2. What if I do this? Margin top 30px. Is that going to increase the margin? Is that going to increase the space between those two things? It doesn't. Now, that's one of those that seem like it's wrong until you think about it for a second. All right? What does a margin mean? A margin means that I want at least 30 pixels between it and it. A, a, a bottom margin says I want at least. 30 pixels in this case between this element and the element below it. Margin top says, on the second element, says I want at least 30 spaces between this and the thing above it. So, what we had was this. Here's my H1. I specified a margin bottom of 30px. That says I wanted 30 pixels between it and its neighbor below. All right? So that's what it looked like after my first change when I added the bottom margin. Everything was okay there. Then I said, on this guy, I said margin top 
30 px. That says I want at least 30 pixels between this and its neighbor above. Well, guess what? If I put 30 pixels between them, that satisfies both the margins. All right? So if I put 30 pixels below, 30 pixels above, it's not going to add them together and give me 60 pixels. This is called margin collapsing. All right? In other words, I'm specifying I want at least 30 pixels between this and that. I want at least 30 pixels between this and that. 30 pixels between it will achieve that goal. Alright? There is in fact a margin of 30 pixels for this below and there is in fact a margin of 30 pixels above. So its nearest neighbor is 30 pixels above it. This guy's nearest neighbor is 30 pixels below it. Now what if I change this to 40 pixels? How is that going to change the page? It's going to go with the larger of the two. So in other words, if I make 40 pixels, then 40 pixels. So that satisfies both margins again. Yes, the nearest neighbor is at least 30 pixels below it. Yes, the uh, nearest neighbor is at least 40 pixels below it. So let's go and do that. So there I make it 40. And if I hit refresh, it dropped down a little bit. That was confusing to me when I first saw it because you'd, you'd put margins in and you'd think that they add up. And they don't. Think of the margin as a condition that needs to be satisfied. All right? And as long as it's satisfied, it doesn't need to add any extra space if it's already satisfied. So margin is one of the key things in the box model. Margin is the space between block elements. Margins are in four directions. Top, right, bottom, and left. You can specify all of the margins together or you can specify um, one at a time. Or you can specify two at a time by saying margin 0px, 10px. Then 0 will be the top and bottom, 10 will be the right and left. How wide is a block element? The entire page takes up 100% of the page. How tall is a block element? As tall as it needs to be. All right. So those are the browser defaults. That's how it's going to be unless you put something else in. All right. So, let's go and put, oh, one other thing before we go into other parts. Notice that these words are flush up against up against the side of that. What if I want to have a little bit of space between the edge of the page and the words? That is called padding. All right. So, if I do padding, 10 pixels, and on this one, let's do padding 20 pixels, just so that we can see a difference. All right. Here there's 20 pixels between the edge and the text. Here, um, I'm sorry, 10 pixels between the edge and the text. Here is 20 pixels between the edge and the text. And it goes again in all four directions. It's amazing what the padding will do to the readability of the pages. All right. Especially if you start, you've used different color borders and backgrounds and things like that. All right. 
It's amazing how, how do I want to say this? How much more polished it looks if you have padding in there. Yes. Yeah. That's all right. No, if it's padding, it's all four of them. The way, yeah, the way it works is like this. This is true for padding. It's also true for margin and border and maybe some other ones that I'm not thinking of. Definitely true for margin and padding and border. No. No, you can specify. Yeah, you, 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 can, you can either do it, you can either specify individually or you can specify sort of a shorthand. So let's talk about padding. We have a text here and we have text like this. There's four paddings, right? There's a top padding, there's a right padding, which isn't really relevant because the text isn't long enough to fill out the whole thing. There's a bottom padding, and there's a left padding. If I say padding 50px, that gets applied to the top, the right, the bottom, and the left. So it would make it look like this. All right. So if I only specify one number for padding or one number for margin, it does going in all four directions. If I specify two numbers, fifty is the top, ten will be the right, fifty will be the bottom, and ten will be the left. So it does it like a clock. So if I were to do this, the padding would look like this. There'd be more padding on the top and bottom than there is on the right and left. That's a slash. What's a slash? Between the 50 and the 0. No, that's, that, this is supposed to be a 1. Oh, there's just a space between them? Yes. Them yes, just a space. You could do 3, but that's very confusing. Because if I did 3... It would be 50, 10, 2, and 50 again. All right. So usually you do 1 or you do 2. Or you could do 4. You could do all 4. Usually you don't do 3. So let's go and play with this to demonstrate this. I'm going to do it with margin, though, instead of padding, because I think margin's a little easier to visualize. Let's look at my H1. I could say margin 50px. And I'm going to get rid of the margin on the other one. Okay, so margin 50px, what does that mean? Nothing else has a margin on this page, okay? So the only margin we're dealing with is the margin of the H1. If I said margin 50px, it means the top has 50px, the right has 50px, the bottom has 50px, and the left has 50px. If I say margin 50px, 1px, then top is 50, the right is 1, which we can barely see. Let's make it 10. Fifty, ten, fifty, ten. All right? Because we go clockwise. Top is 50, right is 10. Then we repeat. 50 for the bottom, 10 for the left. If I were to do 50, 10, 2, 
So it's kind of goofy. But if I did do that, 50, 10, 2, and 10 again. I'm surprising. I would have expected that to be 50. But what do I know? If I then specify in all four directions, then they go in order. All right, 50, 10, to 100. Now, I can also specify, that's just by using the margin. I can also specify a margin dash bottom, a margin dash top, and so on. Alright, there I put it back to that there's a 30 pixel margin on the bottom in there. Yes? So, we kind of talked about it, but what if you wanted to take the blue Okay, well, we would do that by, well, there, there's a few different ways to do it. First of all, we just a second ago deliberately made the blue wider by putting padding there. All right, so one way to do that is if we didn't want the, the blue to be as, as big, we'd just get rid of the padding, right? So if we get rid of the padding, that's going to make the blue narrower. Um, you, you could probably do that by giving a height on it. That probably would do it. Let's see. That does it. Of course, I can't see it because it's a white font on a white background. Um, let's just say that that's sort of an edge case. That's something you don't necessarily want to do. Um, most of the things that you're describing are some combination of the height, width, margin, padding, and border. And you can play with those to achieve what um, you're looking for. All right, let's put this back with a padding of 20. All right, next thing, and we've touched on this before, and again, this is another one of those shorthand properties where you can specify um, individual, top, left, right, and bottom, or you can specify them all together, and that is the border property. All right? So... I can specify border. I'm just going to put a bottom border on this. Five px red dotted. Again, the border goes even deeper because I could say border dash bottom dash color border dash bottom dash width border dash bottom dash style or I can lump them all in the border dash bottom. CSS is smart enough to know that five pixels is not a color five pixels is a width. Red is not a width it is a color 
dotted is not a color nor a width, but a style. Yes? No. Because again, it sees red, it knows that red can only possibly mean the color. So it does it based on context. So there we go, there's a red dotted border. Let's make it bigger so everyone can see it. So I'll make it 15 pixels. All right, there we go. Now to demonstrate the answer to the question, let's move red to the beginning of this. has no effect because again red could only mean the color it can't mean it doesn't mean the style or it doesn't mean the width of it I can also give a border to everything by saying Um, I see what you're saying. Let me ponder that for a second. This is sort of a fluke because it's not a solid border. All right. The way it works is like this, if, I, if memory serves. I have a block element with padding. So this is the padding. Then I have a margin. All right. The, and if I give a background color to this, the margin does not get the background color. All right does not get the background color of my black element. All of this area gets the color of my background color. The text and the padding. The border has its own color. So if you notice in the case of the gray border, the gray border goes all the way around it. The reason you're seeing the blue peeking through is because with the dotted, there's space. So if we were to measure to that, my guess would be that the padding is from here to here. The border is outside of the box and the padding, and it's just getting the, the gaps between or getting the background color. Now, to make that white, ugh, I don't know. Like, if you want to make that, like, white, um, that I would have to look up. Let's spend a second looking that up to see if there is
there's any attribute for that. Placing border inside of div and not on its edge. Some of these answers are not CSS standards. And some of these are, are asking to do, and this question specifically is asking to do the opposite. How to move that border inside of there. That, that wouldn't deal with borders. I, I guess I don't have an answer for this. You could, you could play around with this, um, but um, there might be that box sizing property that I glanced at a second ago could be the key to it, but that, that's a good question. Yeah, I don't, I don't have an answer off the top of my head. I have maybe some workarounds I'm thinking of, but I don't have a good definitive answer. Now, the other thing that we can do is we can control the height and the width of this. Now, heights and widths, um, we can either give an absolute value to. In other words, we could say we can make the height 50 pixels, 100 pixels, or we can make the height and width a percentage. Now, ultimately, we are not going to use absolute heights and widths very often. All right, but they're simpler to go over, so I'm going to start off using them, and then we'll go into the percentages. So I can say height 100 pixels with 400 pixels. And if we look at that, whoops, we have that. Height and width. Now, I mentioned that we can have width as a percentage. All right. So let's change the width to be 40%. Okay. All right. Not much of a difference. But as I make it smaller, it makes it smaller. Notice it brings the content down automatically, the browser adjusts it. One thing I will say in defining your CSS, I've sort of alluded to this, but keep in mind that the browser is sort of your friend. Your browser is working to the same ends, displaying the web page as you are. So don't fight the way browsers act. Understand the way they act and use that to your advantage. Now, one thing you could do is maybe I don't want it to get any smaller than this size, let's say. So I can specify a minimum width as well. Oops. 
So, that I specified 40%, but I also specified a minimum width of, of 250 pixels. So it will make it smaller, 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 smaller. When it hits a certain part, it will stop making it smaller. Notice by default, I didn't specify any width on this one. How big does it make it? By default, it makes a black tag 100%. How tall does it make it? As tall as it needs to be. How do we center things? We center things with the margin of auto. So I can say margin, I actually could do this, margin 0px auto 30px for the bottom margin and an auto for the left margin. Depends, yeah, depends what you're talking about. Text align would, would center the content within the container. So if I wanted the word CSS box model, or block model, um, centered, I could say on the H1, text align center. And there that centers at. All right. Okay, so what I want to do now is I want to accomplish a small dummy wireframe. All right, we have enough information now to, to do it. All right, to do a simple wireframe simply with the properties that we've covered so far that is, margin, padding, border. Trying to remember them all. Manning, uh, margin, padding, border, height, and width. Remember, you don't have to specify all these properties. And in some cases, you're better off not specifying the properties. For example, the height property. If I make the height property something, let's make it 30px. sort of cuts it off. All right. Well, I want it to be as big as it needs to be, in which case don't specify any height property and the browser's smart enough to make it as big as it needs to be. So I mean by don't fight the browser. All right, here's the wireframe that I'm going to develop. We can I'm sure we can do this by the end of class today. Very simple wireframe. Looks like that. All right. 
look sort of like the kinds of pages we've been doing so far, but we're going to take a little more care in doing it. So it's not just a, a linear thing. We're going to like really format it and, and make it, uh, try to make it look good. All right. So let's go and start this. This example, I am going to put the CSS in a different file because guess what? Next time I'm going to go and I'm going to change the CSS without touching the HTML to show you how we can get a different layout of the page without having to change the HTML at all. As long as we've identified the HTML and the, the pieces that um, comprise the structure of the HTML, then we can style it however we want. So. I'm going to save this as wireframe. I'm going to create a new file. Just going to put some color in there for now. I'm going to point to that CSS file. So I'm going to put my four sections in here that correspond to the four pieces of the wireframe. And then I'm just going to put some placeholder text in there for now. And again, here's where the whole bit of the prototype comes into play. This is a prototype I just want to demonstrate how it's going to look and how it's going to act. I have nine minutes to the end of class today, so I'm not going to be too uh, attentive to um, the exact text that I put in. So in the footer, I'll put a paragraph that says copyright M. Zellers 2015. So just to have something in the footer. In the section, I'll go and grab some Greek text. I'll generate one paragraph. I'll just put a wireframe here. And for my nav, what is a nav? A nav is a list of links. I'm just going to put a list of dummy links in here. Oops. In an unordered list.
And just in the interest of time, I'm just going to link them to the top of this page. And I'll say link, link. There we go. And if we look at this, this is what we have. All right. So I know my CSS is linked to my HTML, and I know I have my five parts or four parts. So in my style sheet, I'm going to leave the HTML for now because this is just a wireframe prototype. I'll polish this up later. I'm really focusing on the HTML now. So, I'm going to put a rule for the header. I'm going to make background white. With 60% min width 400 pixels and I'm going to do everything has a margin of nothing a padding of 10 pixels and a border of five pixels solid black. All right. On the wild card. Thanks. Okay. Let's look at this. <laughs> What's wrong with that? Well, we kind of have like mega borders here. All right, so let me get rid of the border in there. I don't want that. We'll put that in. How could I do it just on certain things? Well, I could do... This is really what I wanted, but <laughs> browsers being smart, Alex, didn't give me what I wanted. It gave me what I said. So what I really wanted is this. Header, section, nav, and footer to have the border. That's more like what I wanted. All right. I can give these... Actually, I can put this on this. Let me do this. Separating by commas like this simply is just like duplicating the rule. In other words, I've, for the sections, for the header, for the nav and the footer, I all want to have these rules. And there we go. All right. Most of the way there. One missing piece. These are stacked vertically, and I want them stacked horizontally. All right. That's easy enough to correct by saying that in my nav section, LIs, I don't want to be treated like block tags. So their display type is not block. Instead, they're inline tags. 
And I could get rid of the bullet point by saying any UL in my nav section I have to Google that. Not text decoration. It's I think it's display style type. List style type. Yeah, list style type. None. got that. So, this had some pretty simplifying assumptions. In other words, I assumed that I wanted my header, nav, section, and footer to look the same. But we quickly went and we converted this into a wireframe. All right? And for a prototype. Now, is this good enough for a prototype? Mm, it depends. It depends on what your user is looking for. In other words, this shows the basic layout and structure of the page. It would be nice if these links worked, all right? And um, maybe we don't want these to be the identical color. Maybe we want to vary the color and all that. But at least we've moved in the right direction and we have something to build on. Next time we will cover more uh, with this example and we'll show how you can exert even greater control over the positioning of the elements on the page. Questions? All right, see you in the lab.